Welcome into yet another edition of Instant Reaction Inside Carolina Podcast. I'm your host, Tommy Ashley. That's Taylor Vipolis. Greg Barnes, feel like I've seen you today, Greg. I think this is show three. And Sherelle McMillan is always hard at work. Even as we speak, Caleb Love's announcement that he is leaving the North Carolina program, entering the transfer portal, has got us all here. Just a programming note, folks. Of course, we're always sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt. Y'all know that. But also, the second half of the show will be Pax and Wojcik's commitment to pod with Joey, Sean Moran, and Sherelle will stick around with that for that so we'll do about 30 minutes or so on Caleb Love and what it means for UNC and then we'll switch it over to the recruiting guys um, because that's the next big thing is all the recruiting I believe five open scholarships available currently for Hubert Davis and his team Greg let me bring you in here first Uh, not unexpected but still just seems like a big deal um, that Caleb Love is leaving North Carolina yeah, for sure, Tommy, and, and certainly not uh, unexpected. We, we knew this was coming, didn't exactly know when, but it's it's finally public. Uh, and you know, we, we've talked about it a lot over the years, but Caleb Love is just an enigma. Um, I, I think that's probably the, the best word for him. Some incredible highs, some head-scratching lows. Um, you know, and I, I think – let me say this to begin. Um, as we get five, ten years out, I think um, all of the struggles and all of the issues will kind of fade away. And what people will remember most is uh, the shot against Duke in the Final Four. Like he's he's responsible for putting the final nail into Coach K's coaching career. And uh, Carolina fans will forever remember that as one of the best shots in in Carolina basketball history. Uh, and as I've pointed out a number of times, his second half against UCLA in the Sweet 16 last year, that's the the best half of basketball by one player that I've ever covered live, uh, hands down. It was just that impressive. Um, and we can dive into a lot of the other stuff, Tommy, but that's kind of my main takeaways. You hate to see it kind of end the way it has ended. Um, but Caleb brought a lot. I know he was a kid that uh, – Fans seem to either love or hate for, for various reasons. But I think that the fact that he was able to stamp his his legacy uh, in, in Carolina lore means a lot. And I think that'll, that'll uh, kind of hold history as we move forward into the, the coming decades. Sherelle, let me get you in here. Um, of course, you've covered this forever. You, you are um, the preeminent expert in all the comings and goings out of North Carolina, just your overall thoughts. I mean, like we said off the top, not unexpected, but still, um, it's a pretty big deal when one of the legendary shot makers in Carolina history decides to leave, um, your overall take on where we are. I would say I understand kind of what everyone is feeling, I I would suppose, and that there are a lot of people who are sad and, I get it. You know, the kid was at UNC for three years and, uh, you know, he was a big time recruit coming out of high school, was kind of part of what was supposed to be the the restoration of Carolina basketball after that disastrous COVID season in 2019, 2020. They got cut short. Huge recruiting class. You know, he was the highest rated guy in the class, kind of had the swagger that, you know, UNC maybe had been missing and he had the skills and, you know, he was going to lead Carolina into this, this next era. And, it didn't quite happen that way. And so I understand why the folks who were like, man, this, this is weird that someone is uh, recognizable in the UNC uniform is, could potentially play somewhere else next season. So I, I get that. And then I understand the other side of it too, and that sometimes relationships just come to a natural end. They run their course. And I think that's what happened here. I, I know that's what happened here. Um, I think this is a good thing for Caleb moving forward. And I think it's probably TBD, but it could be a good thing for North Carolina as well. You know, so it's not a situation where one side was begging the other to come back or, or, or whatever. It was just a deal where I think everybody looked at it and said, you know what, this probably isn't the best for me. It's, it, it's, it'll be better if we go our separate ways. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what college basketball is right now. So, I, like I said, I understand both sides. And um, the other thing seen a lot of stuff about Caleb, the, the I don't want to call him a kid because he's 21, but Caleb, the person. And 
just because there was on-court chemistry issues, which I, I think were pretty obvious <laughs> to the untrained eye, doesn't mean that like he's a bad person or a bad man or um, you know anything else that I've seen. It just means that sometimes stuff doesn't work, and you know the the backcourt that uh, him and RJ uh, it worked well for <laughs> probably. 30 games out of 101, but those 30 games were pretty magical. So I think that's what you remember is uh, just that the highs and the lows, um, him coming out of high school is, is the guy, and then kind of obviously the, the shot will be remembered forever. Yeah, I've said it before, um, being in the Superdome down in New Orleans, uh, I mean, I've seen a lot, been around a lot. Uh, that was as big a moment as has ever been in Carolina basketball. Um, outside of the national championships. And I'd argue that uh, that shot, had they even beaten Kansas, would have been bigger than that game. Um, there, Vip, get in here on this discussion. You, you've been on this and done a lot of work on Caleb um, over the past few years. Your your take on, on all this and how it's gone down before we look ahead. Yeah, echoing what Greg and Rel have said, my, my first thought is I hope Caleb Love does well after leaving Carolina. Um, in my mind, he he really is like a, a misunderstood player. When I did the piece on him last year in the NCAA tournament, from talking to people around him, the people that are closest to him, the most obvious thing was that since he's picked up a basketball, he's been taught to play basketball only one way. And that is to be the guy that wants to take the shot. And you saw how, how awesome that mindset is during the highs where he puts the final dagger in Duke. And like Greg mentioned to this day, it was the best single game performance that I think I've ever seen in person that game against UCLA. And for better or for worse, he was given the keys to this Carolina offense as their highest usage rate guy with players around him that couldn't really um, that couldn't really accentuate his strengths. It's like a, a, a square peg in, in a round hole type situation. And kind of off the, the point that Rel was making to close it, I, I really believe it, it's been drastically like understated um, just how much he took on social media fr from the fan base, from fans over the course of three years and how he's still a 21 year old. Like when I was talking to his dad last year, um, for that piece in the final four, his dad was like, he, he sees it all. He, he reads it all. And it, it's one thing to say, you know, maybe a player doesn't fit in an offense, but like the cancer talk, um, and, and all that where, where you start to get personal, it's, it's gotten to the point where, uh, like, I, I don't remember who mentioned it, but we got to this situation where it was best for, for both parties to move on and start fresh. But my hope for the Carolina fan base is that he is remembered for last year's March run because of how awesome it was. And, I think now you could see with, with no one seeds even making the Elite Eight, like how tough it is to win in the tournament in a tournament type setting. And, you know, what, what those guys did last year should still be celebrated. Tommy, along those lines, I think this is, this is good to kind of flesh out and iron out. Um, there was a lot of heat for Caleb on social media. And we've, we've talked about the impact of social media over the years, you know, Nate Britt and Justin Jackson. Uh, they actually got off of social media, and that's dating back, what, eight, seven, eight years ago now. Uh, Kennedy Meeks had a, had a spell where he was kind of lashing out. Um, so it's not new. It's an unfortunate aspect of it. That being said, Rel, there's some speculation floating around that Caleb decided to leave because of the, um, the noise that he heard on social media kind of criticizing him for his play this year. Is that accurate? Um, no, that's not the. I'm I'm sure it was a component. I'm sure there there are pieces of that that are in there because, you know, I've seen some of the stuff, you know, screenshots of some of the stuff that the public hasn't seen is is some vile things that that were sent to him. Um, so I, I definitely think 
that impacted it. But in the end, this was, I think, a basketball decision on both sides. Um, that's what it comes down to. And I think Caleb, um, you know, they had their, their end, of year, end of the year meeting pretty much as soon as the season ended. And, you know, after that meeting, it kind of became clear where this was going. And that was March 11th or 12th. I think it was like Selection Sunday, basically. Um, so this has been heading in that direction since then. Um, but yeah, I, I think it has more to do just with, you know, the, the parties have um, moved on, so to speak, both of them. And it's it's better for both of them to, to continue elsewhere, um, you know, to run its course. You know, whatever phrase you want to use, it has more to do with that. Um, but I, I do think the social media part it w was tough to handle. And in talking to, you know, people close to him, it, it definitely impacted him. And, you know, I, I think talking about basketball is fair game. You know, if you want to talk about him not being a great shooter or being inefficient, I think those, you know, that's fair. You can do that. But it, when it, when it goes to talking about him as a person and talking about his family, that's when stuff got, you know, starts to get a little too far and, you know, calling him a cancer and all those kind of things like Taylor mentioned. So um, to answer your question in a very short way now, after I've blabbered on for two minutes uh it wasn't the reason but i definitely think it was a small percentage of it and the thing with him being a, a high usage and efficient player he's still playing all those minutes it's not like he was going out and doing anything that he wasn't being directed to do so th that's kind of why i made the the square peg into a round hole type analogy where you know he, he's not going rogue out there it's by design for him to to get as many looks as as he was getting or else there would have been you know some some blowback and he wouldn't have been playing as much or or taking as many shots i don't think yeah i don't think there's any doubt about that taylor um uh, chris gallows i guess at dadgum box scores on, on twitter had posted right after the season ended i think since february one caleb had played the highest percentage of minutes of anybody on the team um, so yeah, you're exactly right. It's, it's not as though, uh, you know, he's been benched for not doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's certainly doing, uh, what, what he was uh, allowed to do. And as we talk a lot, Tommy, you kind of, you get what you allow, right? Indeed. And I think, um, to speak to what Taylor and Sherelle have talked about, there's a difference in criticizing and being critical of the game. Um, and to play on the court. I, I mean, I will freely admit we've done that a plenty on this podcast and as as elsewhere. What Sherelle and Taylor are speaking to is far beyond that. And, you know, I've already had to use the ban button in the chat because some of that mess was going on in the YouTube chat. I, I mean, there, there's one thing to say somebody is not getting it done on the court. There's another thing to say all the extra mess. Um, that is the noise that Hubert Davis references an awful lot, um, or at least part of that. Um, sort of, Sherelle, let me ask you this, because people are asking, is there any news or, I mean, I don't even want to even think about it. we got so much to talk about coming into North Carolina, but like, where would, where would somebody like Caleb wind up? Any idea where those possibilities lie? Since you're now covering recruiting for 360 other D1 schools. Um, I don't know if he's like officially in the portal yet, but I know that other schools, there's a lot of schools interested, uh, a lot of high level schools who are interested because, you know, coaching staffs have the ultimate confidence in themselves most of the time. And, you know, if you're, if you're a, a school in the Midwest or a school in the West or a school in the South, you know, why not, <laughs> uh, take a chance on Caleb Love? Because you've seen, you've seen, I'm raising my hands for those on the podcast. You've seen the highs and what he can do. I mean, the UCLA second half and the Duke second half are as good of basketball offensively that, you know, I've seen in a while, you know, up there with some of the stuff that Ty Lawson and Joe Forte and, and Rashad McCants and Ray, Raymond Felton did back in the day. So that kind of talent is tantalizing. And it's like, well, why wouldn't you, if you're another school, take a chance on that? Um, you know, your, your particular set of issues or um, things you have going on in your locker room or on your team are probably not exactly similar to UNC. And, you know, it's a fresh start. It's a lottery ticket. I mean, <laughs> Caleb Love is, is seriously a lottery ticket because if you're able to hone in what he does well and get him to be more efficient, you've got a really talented player on your hands. And if he goes somewhere else and it doesn't work out, well, it's not a big deal because it's just one, you know, probably one year. Um, but I, I can say that 
there are a lot of schools who are already showing interest in in this world of back channel communication and non-official communication and uh, you know all the stuff that happens have been interested for some time. Indeed, it does. Uh, he will get opportunities, plenty of opportunities. And um, to Taylor's point, if the round peg and the round hole meet meet up, it could be a special opportunity for him uh, to further his basketball career. Because I, I think there's one thing for certain: he's got talent. Uh, he's got physical talent, and he puts it all together. I mean, Greg, to your point, and I wanted to sort of put it in perspective a little bit because you've covered this for a long time and, and followed it. He's as mercurial a player, and I've said this a lot, as anybody I can remotely remember for North Carolina. Um, I think that's what makes him so tantalizing for other schools. Um, but I think it makes him such a lightning rod um, within the Carolina fan base. And, and I don't want to call out the Carolina fan base because it's no different than any other school, um, really. Um, there, there's people on the fringes of every walk of life here. But your point, you saw him. You mentioned UCLA. Sherelle just mentioned Duke. I've never seen anything like it that that can produce like he was able to produce, yet still be such the lightning rod that he was at North Carolina. Yeah, uh, just going back through some old quotes from Hubert Davis on on Caleb, um, especially last last March during the NCAA tournament run. And I think Hubert nailed it perfectly in saying that, uh, you know, Caleb has the confidence to take the shot, but more than that, he wants to take the shot in the key moment. And that's, that's kind of a rare thing. Um, he is not scared of any shot, good or bad, right? But when it came down to it and they needed a bucket, he was always willing to take that shot. And he made enough of them. Maybe I'm alone on this. But when Carolina was in some of those close games this year, anytime he had the balls, like, would not surprise me if he drains his three-pointer. Now, obviously, more often than not, they didn't go in for him. Um, but very rarely are there players in college basketball that I kind of perk up if he's got the ball in the final 10 seconds of a close game. But Caleb was that guy. And that's a testament to what he's done. Um, and, yeah, you know, you – you go back, and I guess Rashad McCants uh, was kind of up and down, and he was explosive as could be. Uh, but yeah, kind of to, to Rel's point, I think Rel, I think uh, Caleb was a good teammate. Um, he was, you know, if there's ever an altercation on the court, Caleb was the first guy to step up for his teammates. I think that's important to note, um, and I think just his willingness to to kind of be out front and be the guy and to take the shots and, and to you know, when, when you step into that role, you're accepting criticism if you miss it, and you're accepting all the uh, exhilaration and excitement that comes with it if you make it. And he saw that against Duke. And that's just the type of player he is, and I think that's a testament to his character. Uh, and as the other guy said, I mean, like, I, I wish the best for him. You know, maybe he'll find, he'll find a situation that suits him better. Well, you know, he can get the coaching – uh, that maybe better suits him and can have a, a really good last year. Vip, get in, or, Ta or Sherelle, get in. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I like where this discussion is going here um, because folks forget that somebody has to shoot, and, and Caleb was often that guy. Um, probably had a little bit to do with inefficiency, um, but what do I know? Vip, what you got? Yeah, I was going to mention the, the, my favorite story that I heard – um, when I was doing the, the, I think I titled it the restoration of Caleb Love um, because he did have this low moment and then all of a sudden in the UCLA game, he was at the highest of highs. And when I talked to his dad for it, um, my favorite story that I heard from it was it was some like youth, like middle school, like national type tournament. And his team was up. And in a timeout, there was like 10 seconds left. They're up to his dad is the coach. His dad calls a timeout. He's like, we're going to inbound the ball. They have to foul Caleb. Caleb's going to shoot free throws, and he's going to make it. They inbound the ball. He dribbles up the court. Nobody could catch him because he's just faster than everybody. He gets to mid-range, pulls up, doesn't need to shoot, shoots, misses. The other team gets the ball, throws it down the length of the court 
they bank in a three, they win the game. And his dad walking off the court, he, he was honest. And he was like, I wasn't even mad with him. I just told him, if you're going to shoot the ball, you have to make it. And I thought that was like such a great story because he was like, he, he, Caleb was down, like he was hurt that he missed the shot. But like once he gets back home, like before his dad could even, you know, say anything, Caleb's um, like on the floor doing like sit-ups, sit-ups and push-ups. And I think my favorite part, not talking to Caleb for the actual piece, it almost made it seem like like some mythological or like some kind of like lore hearing, hearing everybody's stories about him and how he got to the point where he was at. Um, so that, that was just a, a story I, I wanted to share. And um, it kind of puts a, a person behind uh, or a person in the Jersey that, that uh, fans kind of cheer for. Sherelle, I'm on open it up to you again. Um, Folks, we're listening to live reaction. Caleb Love announces he is leaving North Carolina. Uh, Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com is sponsor of this. Look, there's a thousand plus people in this live chat. What I need you to do is hit the like button on your way out the door and make sure that you subscribe. Maybe there'll be some more emergency pods shortly. Uh, I'm quite sure there will be, so you might want to be notified when the lives go. But Sherelle, um, what more can you add here on Caleb Love's exit and Caleb Love the player? Um, I would add just overall, uh, I do think, yes, he was inefficient. Um, but just as, you know, the season wasn't on one person, um, I don't think his inefficiency is solely on him. Part of it is for sure. But I do think the coaching staff, there's some culpability um, in the way he shot and uh, I guess him continuing to get all of those shots. Um, they're needed to have a, a point in time and we're not aware if that happened or not where it was kind of like hey let's let's find a better way to do this you know we know you have a considerable set of skills let's you know be more well-rounded but i think at times unc devolved into throw the ball to caleb and let something happen and a lot of times when you're <laughs> trying to go one on four one on three one on five you know that's an impossible way to play basketball <clears throat> so again i think um, this was a well, this was a rounded issue. It just, it wasn't a straight line where, oh, Caleb takes bad shots and that's it. Um, there was a lot more that went into it on the basketball side than that. So I think that should be remembered. And then overall, just, uh, you know, Caleb's three years, you know, it was, it was rough, you know, that COVID year, um, that was not anybody's experience. That was not fun for anyone, you know, living in hotels, not being able to hang out with your teammates, going to games and then going back to the hotel, um, that's not, that's not what he signed up for when he came to Carolina. And then his sophomore season didn't start up the best and then just, you know, got on a, a heater there towards the end, you know, against Marquette, uh, the second half against UCLA, the second half against Duke, as I said, some of the best basketball offensively that you'll ever see. Um, so it's just a strange, I think looking back right now, it's just strange how it ebbed and flowed, but in the end, um, when you say Caleb Love, you're going to remember him shooting over Mark Williams, and that's it. You know, it, it's that simple. Um, the the shots missed against NC State or Brown or, or whomever they played, not going to be remembered at all. It's going to be that shot. And that's probably the way it should be because um, I think that is the biggest non-national championship shot in Carolina history. I don't, you know, honestly, I'm sure someone's going to come back with something, but I don't think it's particularly close. I mean, you know, think about what that team did and what Caleb Love helped them do. Um, and I think that's what he should remember by when he, you know, now that he's leaving Chapel Hill. Taylor, get in. I think, think that was perfect by everybody. I have something lighter, uh, non-related that I can mention. Uh, so I was, uh, I was taken over by, by the Kansas State uh, kind of craze that they had and, and the tournament run they had. And I just got this shirt in today. Couldn't, couldn't have had worse timing. My Marquise Noel t-shirt <laughs> for, for those that are listening as an audio only podcast, but uh, couldn't, couldn't have picked worse time. It's been a good tournament. I don't even know what to say. Um, That's it's great. like, did you order it before they lost? I, or I ordered it before they lost. With VIP, fast, VIP, with VIP faster the shipping. VIP the curse. <laughs> <laughs> the VIP curse. We're blaming you now, Taylor Vipless. You are the problem. Uh, Greg I had, Barnes, a rep, I had a rep New York City basketball. <laughs> that that dude was something. 
Uh, it's fun to watch them. Fun to watch Jerome Tang um, coach that team. All transfers, too, so there is hope. Greg Barnes, last comment before this bunch gets out of here and we bring on Coast to Coast to talk a little commitment alert. Well, look, we've seen uh, eight players depart. Leakey wow. and, and Pete moved on, and then you've got six transfers. Um, I think if there's concerning news, it's that uh, Hubert has signed four guys who have already transferred, and he's been here the last two years. We knew there would be a learning curve, as we've talked about so many times before, part of the process. But I think I think moving forward is that I mean, he essentially has a blank slate. I mean, next year's team will be his. No doubt about it. Uh, yeah, RJ and Armando are, are leftovers from from Roy. Uh, I know a couple other guys in there as well, DeMarco. But, uh, I mean, we get to see what Hubert Davis is really about next year. Um, you know, there's – I think that's exciting. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. and But we can finally get away you know, from the fan base saying, oh, wait till he gets his own guys in. No, he's got that opportunity now. And I think that's important for the healing process, for the transition process. And so now we get to see what, what the coaching staff can do with this new crop. Uh, we know there's a lot of exciting kids who may come in in, in 2024 um, if they don't come earlier. And so I think the, the next two years will, will tell us an awful lot about Hubert and this coaching staff. Indeed. Uh, I said it in the football. Um, I'll say it here. Hubert Davis and North Carolina has now eliminated the excuses and eliminating eliminated to the blame game. It, it is their program, like you mentioned, Greg. The next few weeks are going to be crazy as they fill out the roster. Um, we'll be here to talk about it, but we're going to turn this one over to the experts in recruiting. Sherelle, you stay. Vip and Greg, much appreciated y'all being here. I'm going to drop out as well. Um, but first... I'm going to talk about Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com. Joy Powell's got the great uh, reading dulcet tones here. And in fact, Vip, I'm going to drop you. I need Joey to come in there and help me with this read before we get out of here. Thank you, Vip. Joey Powell, you are now up to do my ad read, <laughs> my, my brother. Hey, man, everybody's got to have a role in the squad, right? Um, drop, an, drop an ad read while I find the coast to coast banner and I get out of the way and you guys can carry it forward. You know, it's, it's crazy. I, I hate that I didn't get in on the um, conversation about Marquise Noel because that dude is tougher than a Waffle House T-bone. And I love, <laughs> I love Taylor's shirt. And you know, if Marquise Noel was in Chapel Hill, you know who would have a shirt like that? Johnny T. Johnny freaking T-shirt. And maybe they would have a Marquise Noel tough as a $2 steak. Um, Johnny T-shirt's amazing. I, I don't know if you guys have picked up on that. And what's going to be crazy is, as all these guys transfer into Chapel Hill, they're going to get a chance to stop by Johnny T-shirt on their visit. And when they get a chance to get acclimated into town, they get all their stuff moved in, and they're checking out campus and checking out Chapel Hill, they're going to go to Johnny T-shirt, and they're going to hear, uh, they're going to see all the stuff that they've heard us talk about. They're going to see all the stuff that all these recruit Knicks have said because when they listen to this podcast, they know about Johnny T-shirt because of us. Well, they're going to hear about it and they're going to see about it. And they're going to go in there and be like, man, where can I get my NL shirt? And Johnny T-shirt's going to be like, hey, we got that for you. But also tell them to use that extra 10% that you get off your VIP membership with Inside Carolina. So you'll save 10% off of that. And Johnny T-shirt's going to have the best selection you can think of. So, uh, you know, we like to wish the best of luck to Caleb Love as he leaves Chapel Hill. And I figure he'll probably stop by Johnny T on his way out to grab a couple of things for, for the road. Let me share something real quick, Joey. I don't know, for those who listen to Coast to Coast for a long time, I think about four years ago, I mentioned talking to a parent who wanted to get some Carolina stuff quickly because his son needed it. And uh, we called Johnny T and they were like, hey, we can rush this out and, and try to get to him. But it was it was for Kayla's family. So that, you know, bring it all See? around. They ordered from Johnny T before he uh, came to Chapel Hill because they needed a Carolina uh, sweatshirt. To and see, like we make all everybody thinks we're joking about this, and everybody, you know, if you ever question the amount of information that Sherelle McMillan has at his fingertips, use that as a perfect example and allow this story of Johnny T-shirt coming full circle to 
to complete the the arc as as we bid adieu to Kayla Love and and I'm sure Tar Heel fans yeah you know, have feelings about him, but like you said at the end of the the last pod, Sherelle, that dude will always be remembered for hitting that shot over Mark Williams and uh, pushing UNC to a national championship. So, guys, I want to start this episode as we've got, um, you know, we've got uh, Paxson Wojcik committing to the Tar Heels. And I think the easy thing to think about for fans is say, all right, well, is Paxson Wojcik replacing Caleb Love? And we're going to get into that a little bit. But <laughs> with me, as always, Sean Moran, Cheryl McMillan. Boys, we just talked We just talked 24 hours ago, but now we got to talk about Paxson Wojcik. So Coast to Coast Podcast going right now. Shout out to Johnny T-Shirt for sponsoring. Sean, you and I talked just last night about Paxson Wojcik and what he brought to the table. And I want to refresh everybody on his vitals so that uh, so that if they missed last episode, they know we're talking about uh, six five kids from. He claims Charleston, South Carolina, as his home, but being that, as you referenced previously, his dad spent some time coaching with Matt Doherty in Chapel Hill. Uh, Paxson Wojcik is very familiar with campus and very familiar with the program. Uh, Wojcik averaged fourteen point nine points, seven point two rebounds and just over three assists per game for the Bears at Brown this past year. Uh, dude shot 38% from three, which, as, as you and Sherelle have hammered home, that is a huge Achilles heel for the Tar Heels this past season. Uh, kid was a second-team All-Ivy League selection, and not only played his two years at Brown, he also played two seasons at uh, Loyola Chicago. So, Sean, let's go to immediately how big uh, of an addition is a kid like Paxson Wojcik to the Tar Heel roster, knowing why, why are you laughing? What is it? What's you, you, you're you're killing me here? What what is what does a guy like Pax and Wojcik do uh, for a Tar Heel roster that is now not only just dearth of shooters, is dearth of bodies? So uh, give me your give me your lowdown on that, man. I think it's a great great question. I mean, t- to be honest, I was probably a little surprised when he entered the portal and and UNC reached out. And I know we're probably going to mention this on. Anytime we're talking about a recruit that's not from a power five school, but how, you know, what are you surrounding him with? I would imagine the goal for Paxson coming from Brown to UNC uh, is to, you know, is to, he's not coming to not get off the, off the bench, but I think coming off the bench is, is where he's going to play. Um, and it's going to, it's going to really be determined, you know, it, I think for, for me, he's, he's really a three. Um, mm-hmm. And I think last year at Brown, he played the three, four, his size, you know, he wants the ball in his, his hand. I think it gives you a reliable bench player. I think there's going to be definite question marks about athleticism and how does that translate uh, to UNC and some of the competition. But to go back to what we talked about in the podcast, I think probably one of the main benefits is going to be from the intangible perspective or off the court. Uh, everything you read about him is that he's a, a leader. Uh, when we saw him at Chapel Hill, definitely had some some fiery spirit to him. Uh, you know, I think if coming from what his dad was, uh, mm-hmm. you know, he's not going to take any BS, and you know, he's going to be a no nonsense type of guy. And I think that's probably that that could be exactly what UNC is looking for. It doesn't always have to be the best player that's the leader, uh, and once again, you know, that, that's probably the, what I'm hoping for the most is here's a guy, his dad, you know, went to the Naval Academy, grew up in that, that type, type of dynamic. Um, and now, you know, maybe he's the one that can bring that leadership or that, uh, you know, kind of kicking the, kick the butt that the team needs. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about skill set, but I'd say that's how I see him fitting in and coming off the bench, um, being a reliable role player. Uh, or yeah. somebody that can that can give you anywhere from five to fifteen minutes a game, if not more, if he catches catches fire. Let's dig in a little further. So you know, folks see him; he's probably not going to start. I would imagine if he does, he will definitely have earned it. But he's not going to start. But help folks understand how having a player who has played Division One ball is a second team All Conference player that shoots as well as he does. Help people understand how that one not only developed the bench on the team but how it might help the team just learning how to play defense. Because one of the knocks on Carolina for the longest time is is the inability to mark shooters, right? So you're running against a guy like that in practice all the time. It's got to make you better, does it not? Yeah, and, and before I, I get there, I, 
yesterday we were talking uh, Sherelle's favorite topic, uh, pickup games over the summer. And we went through the alumni that UNC was bringing back in the first game. It was all guys that are playing overseas. And I think if you put yourself, if you're an overseas coach or GM, sure, you want the, the UNCs and, and, and the big names, but you almost go right to the Ivy Leagues uh, in terms of, of guys that are reliable, guys that know how to play a team game and guys you can count on off the court. And you often see Ivy League players um, doing much better in the long run than, than a lot of uh, more talented players. So I think that is also true for, for this situation where last season in the Ivy League, um, I almost had to do a double take because he was number four in scoring in conference play. Uh, he was number four, or sorry, number five in scoring, number four in rebounding, number four in assists and number two in assist to turnover ratio. So offensively, he knows how to play. And I think from a UNC perspective, you can count on somebody that's now five years in. Um, he knows how to play, knows what to do. He's a tough, tough guy. And once again, I think the main hope is reliability, um, reliability and leadership from Paxson. I'll go ahead and say it so everybody else can get out of the way. Coach's son, Jim Rat, <laughs> knows for the ball, uh, you know, uh, a real real floor burn type of kid. All right, Cheryl, I want you to come in and tell us a little bit about how this developed. Because as of last night, you know, after he'd had a visit to, to campus, um, we didn't really know much about how this was going to transpire other than that North Carolina had talked to him and that he was he was taking a visit to town. So um, also shout out to Cheryl for going back to back on, on two shorts, two, two shows here. So uh, big ups to my man for sticking around for a coast to coast. But Cheryl, how did this whole thing develop, man? All right, Joey, before we do that, I grew up in the Pentecostal church, and we mm-hmm. are, we, what we do is we repeat things. So the minister says, repeat after me. So I want you to repeat after me. Neighbor? Pax- no, wait, I'm sorry. My bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paxton Wojcik is not a Caleb Love replacement. Again, Just because he committed the day yes. that Caleb Love left, say it with us, folks in the chat. Paxton okay. Wojcik is not a Caleb Love replacement. Perfect. Thank you. Nice. Um, so, you know, North Carolina likes to operate uh, kind of in a clandestine manner. Uh, they do stuff behind the scenes. They don't talk to a lot of people. Um, they just, that's just how they've operated, uh, all the way back to Roy Williams, basically. In silence, in silence, like lasagna. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, and so we were able to find out that he was, uh, taking a visit. We didn't know when, and it happened to be on Sunday. Um, so I think the alarm bell started to go off a little bit, like, man, they, there hasn't been much uh, in his recruitment. You know, he does have a, a history of Chapel Hill, you know, in Chapel Hill of, of knowing UNC and all that good stuff. Um, they're going to need, frankly, bodies, you know, on the team. They've got six, five or six available scholarships at the moment. Um, and then uh, the other thing was um, when you, you know, take a visit that quickly and there's been no other reported visits, it just all of the stuff started to click and was like, hmm, this this could happen. Um, I didn't expect it to happen today. Didn't expect it to happen tonight. Um, but, you know, UNC obviously had been talking to him for a little bit. And once they got him on campus, it seems like they, they sealed the deal fairly quickly. Um, and the other thing I should add is that this doesn't impact uh, Nick Timberlake, who uh, before we had said is coming on a visit this week, but we believe he's scheduled to be on campus tomorrow. Um, so this doesn't impact him. They see him as kind of a, a, a different um, player. They're, they're similar, but different enough where they can both be on the team. And again, um, Nick Timberlake is not a Caleb Love replacement where he to, to commit to UNC. This Nick is, Timberlake is not a Caleb Love <laughs> replacement. Gotcha. This this is simply North Carolina addressing, I'm going to say this for the ninth time, and I'm sure we'll say it again Sunday when we do this for the 10th time. North Carolina is addressing a historically bad you know, shooting season with the guys who can shoot. In addition to that, if you look at their profile and, and watch them both play, they got a little edge to them. They have a little edge. And I think at times that was missing from UNC this season. So uh, in talking to folks, you know, close to his recruitment and kind of who knew what was going on, they said North Carolina liked his toughness um, mm-hmm. and they liked that he knew how to win um, and they liked that he knew how to play. Know how to play, Sean, is what uh, we kept hearing over and over again. He knows how to play. He knows how to play. Uh, so you can do worse than a second team, you know, all Ivy guy who is in his fifth year as, um, you know, a piece on your team. Okay. 
stay there because I'm seeing folks in the chat and shout out to everybody who's here. I think there's over a thousand folks listening to us tonight. So, Hey, big ups to all you guys who join us tonight. We love that you guys are here and love that you're a part of the fan. The, the Tr- chat about uh, Shrell being in church for six hours on Sunday. Absolutely. <laughs> now, um, so, so what, what I, what I want to, what I want to get here. Um, some folks are saying Carolina is desperate and that's absolutely not what is happening right now. I mean, maybe they're desperate for bodies, um, you know, because they have a lot of spots to fill. But Sherelle, can you please speak to that? That just because this is the first guy Carolina takes, you know, again, help folks understand this is a very fluid process. You do this much better than I do. So, so explain to everybody that just because they're taking a guy that's a second team, you know, Ivy League player and he's not a, you know, first round NBA pick at this point, you know, see if you can get folks to pump the brakes on making an assessment of, <laughs> of UNC's work in the transfer portal. Okay. First, Paxson Wojcik is not a Caleb Love replacement. <laughs> um, That's my man. I love you for that, dude. No, you know it's it again. It is a it's simultaneously a sprint and a marathon because you, you do need to start you know filling out your roster and, and getting players who you know will be on campus so you can work through logistics and make sure they're here for, for a summer session so you can start integrating them into everything that UNC wants to do. At the same time, there are going to be more talented players who come into the portal. Like I, I guarantee it. I I, I know it. <laughs> like it's just it's it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Look at a Terrell's phone. <laughs> it's going to happen, and it's going to happen. You know, there will be some in the next week. There'll probably be some in three weeks. There'll probably be some in a month. And you know, they don't have to. Players don't have to withdraw from the NBA draft. So the, let me start over. What a lot of players are doing, or, or players who have pro interests, what Pete Nance did last year, is you. Uh, announced for the NBA draft, you enter the portal at the same time. You go through the pre-draft process and you determine whether or not you're going to go to the NBA. For guys who are doing that, most of the time, they're not going to be able to be drafted. They just want to get that feedback. Then they have until May 31st to withdraw from the draft and they still still can be in the portal because they're already in there. So they don't have to make a decision just because the portal closes. As long as you're in the portal before it closes, which I believe is May 13th, um, you can still you know, figure out what you want to do. So, you know, you have to be careful. You want to take guys who you can, who you think can help, but you also want to make sure that you're allowing yourself to be open and have the scholarships available for, you know, additional talent that might come through. So it's a balancing act. And I don't think taking Paxson Wojcik, who is not a Caleb Love replacement, is going to um, impact what North Carolina does down the road because they have a, a bunch of scholarships open. Like I said, five or six scholarships uh, open and you, you don't have to be super, super selective um, when you have five or six scholarships open. And, and again, they're all at the wing, right? Like, so you've got to have bodies. And I, I, to to quote Sherelle, what he said earlier, I want to make sure everybody hears this. He made the comment earlier that UNC could do a lot worse than a second team all Ivy League player who has played four years of college basketball and scored as well as he did last year and shot 38% from three. UNC could do a lot worse than that. And, Sean, and Joey, Joey, let me add something too. We, we talked about yeah. it the whole time, is that you have to judge, you can't judge one individual move and say, okay, Carolina, what are they doing in the transfer portal? There's no yeah. one good in there. They're taking, you know, Paxson Wojcik, you know, and, and I've, I've seen that kind of just anecdotally, on, yeah. again, on social media, which is not a representation of everybody. Um, but you have to look at the plan first. And the plan is to, get more athletic and improve their shooting, get more athletic, improve shooting, and overall just be better. So the question is, do you think having someone like Paxson Wojcik will help North Carolina be a better team next season? Um, you can say yes or no, but I think you have to respect the plan and say, well, okay, I can see how that makes sense, why they would think that he does. Um, and then we can judge the merits you know, of, of how they um, uh, executed on the plan later. So I think let's let's judge the plan, which is, are they yeah, getting better, um, you know, from a shooting perspective? Are they getting more athletic, and are they getting better as a team? So when the day comes in June or July when the roster is is solid, we can say, did they execute on their stated plan? Yeah, I, I, again, I appreciate you resetting that. And for those who are listening and aren't watching us live, I do think we're making some some progress in getting folks to understand that Paxson Wojcik nor Nick Timberlake are Caleb Love replacements. Uh, Sean, I want to come back to you, man. Um, help, I guess, give some context a little bit. We talked earlier about how a player like Wojcik 
uh, while he may not be preseason first team all ACC, but help people understand how having a player like that who is a veteran, who is savvy, but who can just shoot from anywhere, just about anywhere in the gym. What does that do as far as developing depth? And what does that do as hopefully folks being able to see Hubert Davis stretch the bench next year? Right. We talked about, you know, how how he didn't get a chance to let the younger guys play this year. So not only do you get a, a depth piece to help challenge the starters and challenge the rest of the squad, but maybe if you get a guy that's a veteran, they can be trusted more than maybe the guys that Hubert Davis had at his disposal this past year. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I think that's the hope in terms of, of trust. It was obvious that the trust did not exist this year uh, with with some of, with a lot of the bench players in terms of how they were utilized. Uh, with what they're potentially bringing in next year, bench is going to be very important. So it'll be interesting to see, does Coach Davis rely on what he's been doing the past two years? And once the second half begins, he's not making a substitution uh, unless he is forced to. And I think that could definitely have negative ramifications next year in the portal um when when you see the guys that they recruited this year uh that then didn't didn't play but hypothetically uh they utilize a bench uh, a guy like paxton is, is coming off the bench and once again coach's son great assist to turnover ratio you know very efficient knows how to play um you know he can come in left-handed guy uh you know you, you mentioned the 38 percent shooting and it's not a high, high volume around 150 shots this year but Last year, you know, it was only around 30, 33%. So I think that that will still be a question. I think he can shoot, uh, but he's not going to be getting seven, seven threes a game. So once again, when you're down to one or two, I think mentally that's a lot, a lot different, which we saw with some of the guys this year. But I mean, all you have to do is go back to his junior year, uh, one of his first few games when he was at the Dean Dome and he didn't shoot. He was 0 for 5 from three, but he attacked the basket Mm left-handed. He's going to. He's going to use his shoulder and go go right into you, um, and I think that's something that we've seen Carolina guys maybe shy away away from contact. Uh, now that ACC might be a little different, where you're going right into somebody and the shot's getting blocked, but he, he's going going to attack. And I think offensively and defensively, he's going to know the plays. Uh, he, he's not going to be out of position. He's probably going to be telling other guys where to go. And I think those are just some of the the key things that. Keyword Davis and the UNC staff didn't have full confidence on doing the right thing at the right time. And I think you're going to get that from him. Uh, and then it's just probably going to be on a game by game situation on matchups. Um, how did he do in the first half? But it is hopeful that it's not going to be just five to six guys, uh, you know, rolling 38, 38 minutes a game again. Sean, I want to come back to you to talk about schematics in a second uh, and spreading the floor with a player like that. Terrell, can you help give some some context to what having veteran players who have played in different places in college basketball but have played four years, uh, what that might do for a player like Simeon Wiltshire coming in next year for, for North Carolina? I think you've seen it across the country um, in that we talked about it last night, that veterans and experienced guys typically win. And I think they have that um, a no nonsense attitude, just because they've been through it. They've they've struggled maybe as freshmen and uh, maybe didn't do all the winning that they wanted to do. Uh, ha- maybe had to try elsewhere to to play, and those combined struggles helped them get to the point where they were. So if you're Paxton Wojcik, who is not a Caleb Love replacement, and you're working with Simeon Wilcher next year, um, I think you know. Wiltshire is a hard worker, and I think there'll be kind of a mutual respect. You'll see, man, this guy from the Ivy League, you know, he worked hard because he, he started off at Loyola Chicago and, and went to Brown, and now he's in Chapel Hill. And, uh, you know, he, he found his way into a scholarship here. And I think that mutual respect of, of uh, work ethic, um, of wanting to be great, of uh, knowing how to win, which, again, is what we heard a lot when it yeah. comes to Wojcik, I think that rubs off. And um, I don't want to use a cliche that a lot of people use uh, about a certain metal that makes people better. But I do think it, it rings true in this particular situation and that being around people who work hard and being around people who want to compete makes you want to work hard and compete. Uh, so even if, if Paxton Wojcik, you know, is the, if he starts or if he's the seventh man or the eighth man, I think his uh, willingness to compete um, his experience and uh, to some degree leadership will definitely rub off on all the UNC players and be a, a net positive. 
Uh, Sean, I think one of the things that we saw this team struggled with this year was uh, the ball was getting stuck. Uh, Brady Mannix, one of his undervalued traits was that the ball never got stuck in his hands. Uh, he always knew how to reverse it, how to keep things moving laterally on the court and to keep the defense on their toes. When you have a player, regardless of whether it's uh, Pax and Wojcik or, you know, potentially other players that may be considering North Carolina that are are shooters, how does that help Hubert Davis's offense do what it is that he's hoping it will do? Yeah, I don't think he's going to be making as quick decisions as, as Brady did in terms of, of moving the ball. But I think one of the things when you when you watch some of his his games, he's a really good really good rebounder, uh, even given his size, around seven seven rebounds a game, mostly defensive, but he can grab and go. And I think the most frustrating thing, at least for me watching UNC this year, was just how horrible they were in transition and just the, the lack of ability to, to move the ball up the court by passing. Uh, and that's something he can do in terms of grab and go. That was something um, Timberlake could do. I'd say Wojcik was probably better at that than Timberlake, but that's just hopefully another addition where you don't have to rely on RJ Davis coming back to the ball. Mm. I think we'd all love to see them play a little bit, uh, you know, more up, up tempo, but um, you know, I think once again, he's a, he's a smart player. It might not move as, as fast because sometimes he does like to, to get the ball and, and uh, you know, look to look to attack, which can take a few seconds to, to set up. But when he does attack, it's not like he has blinders on and the ball's only going to the rim. Uh, if you're if you're cutting or you're you're open, uh, he'll be able to find you. And I think once again that that was something just with how few assists the team did have. Obviously, that's a product of not hitting shots at times. But if you're if you're moving the ball um, if, and if you're finding the right guy in the right position, that can help. So I think he's a he's a, a an upgrade in terms of an IQ perspective, basketball wise. And I think mm-hmm. Carolina uh, definitely needs that, but. The same time, you're going to need some elite athletes as well, and I think that's what we're still hoping to find uh, that can be paired with RJ and Armando. Uh, Sherelle, last question: We need to wrap this thing up and get out of here for the night. Uh, you're listening to the Coast to Coast podcast, Instant Commitment. We're doing a live version, but also this will be dropped into your pod feeds, talking about Pax and Wojcik committing to North Carolina from Brown. He has one year left to play for the Tar Heels. Sherelle, I want to ask, is Paxson Wojcik a Caleb Love replacement? No, I'm kidding. Um, I've seen some folks in the chat already mention that Paxson Wojcik is going to be a Justin Pierce redux. I'm throwing that up to you as a softball, and I want you to debunk that as best as you're able, not only just because of their size discrepancy and the difference in their games, but can you please just speak to that a little bit? Well, I mean, I, I can't really debunk it because I don't know. And anyone claiming that they know – what is going to happen in November, like holler at me. So well, I can... well, people are bunking it in the chat. So <laughs> yeah. I was hoping you could debunk it, but I, I got you. Uh, yeah. I, I, w- I would just say, um, I think the roles will be different. I think, uh, you know, at the time when UNC uh, took Justin Pierce, you know, there wasn't a transfer portal. It was just graduate transfers. And among the graduate transfers, you know, he was one of the top five available pretty much by everybody. So and UNC again, had spots and UNC had spots. So again, judge the plan. The plan is, was that they needed, you know, kind of a guy who could play some, some three and some four and potentially make shots. And it didn't work out that way, but the plan, you know, was solid. Things sometimes just don't work out. I know that's hard to accept, but sometimes you just don't. Um, And I think with Wojcik, he's being recruited from what I understand, um, you know, kind of in a, in a different way. Um, Again, North Carolina has the spots. Um, and this is his, his, his last stop, you know, playing college basketball and more than anything, um, the kid gets a little bit dream. You know, we haven't been able to talk to him, but the quotes that he did give were that, you know, this is a dream school and this is a dream come true. So, uh, you know, that above anything else, I think it will show you, uh, that he'll come in and, and work hard and try to set a good example. And for a team who people say, you know, has maybe been missing, some of that culture, some of that edge uh, post Final Four appearance. And I think it's a, a welcome sight. And again, um, you know, we don't know exactly what his role is going to be, but I can tell you one more time that he is not a Caleb Love replacement. Um, and so just don't treat it <laughs> such. Don't like, because no, I mean, seriously, because what happened last year? No, somebody, somebody's going to hit you up on yeah, the board what, or what, on social what, media what, tomorrow and say, hey, what, what is this dude replacing Caleb Love? No, I got what, you. What happened last year was Brady Manick, you know, uses his eligibility. And then mm-hmm. Matthew Meyer, and they're like, oh, there it is, Brady Manick 2.0, and he didn't come to Carolina. And then it was, oh, Pete Nance, Brady Manick 2.0. 
the first thing Hubert Davis said when uh, when Pete Nance signed was, Pete Nance is going to do some good things for us, but he's not Brady. You know, everybody who covers Carolina, he's not Brady. He's not Brady. He's not Brady. And then when he's not Brady, people are like, why is he not Brady? Well, we, you know, we've been telling you for a year that he wasn't Brady. So I want to go ahead and get ahead of this. Like, Passon Wojcik isn't coming in to, to you know, take, you know, 600 shots or whatever. He's not going to come in and be the guy. That's not, you know, going to be his role. Um, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have a role. And Carolina fans can't be so haughty to think that someone from the Ivy League can't come and help you and see when we watched, you know, the last three weeks, every single team has somebody from a lower level who came up and has played really well in the tournament. So don't don't dismiss it outright just because it doesn't look like you think it is. Don't don't judge a book by its cover. It's like a basic rule we learned when we were like three or four years old. Don't judge a book by its cover. That's it. I'm done. Yeah, but it's just so much more fun to have these like instant knee jerk reactions and freak out about stuff, right? That's 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 why that's why we do what we do. That's why we love that's why we love the social medias and the sports. Anyway, um, hey, shout out to everybody who made uh, made this appointment television or viewing tonight, however you want to call it. A uh, ton of folks in the chat. Um, going to wrap this show. There will certainly be more news coming in the very near future. At minimum, there will be another Coast to Coast podcast dropping for everybody next Sunday night. And hey, if you're in the chat here and you have not subscribed to the Coast to Coast, the hell's wrong with you. Get your life together. Seriously. Um, go ahead and subscribe to all I see's podcasts. Come be a part of it. We appreciate you guys uh, dialing in tonight. Shout out to everybody who's listening right now. I uh, hope that you enjoyed it. Give us a five-star review if you've done so. But this has been the Coast to Coast Podcast. We love you, Johnny T-Shirt, for sponsoring. Thank you to Tommy Ashley for producing this show tonight. Sherelle, man, you played all 40 minutes. And now's your time to go get in the ice bath, take care of those joints, uh, go see Jonas, get yourself taken care of, get some sleep. Sean, appreciate you, buddy. We'll talk to you very, very soon. Uh, and hope that you guys have a good rest of your week. We'll talk to you soon on the Coast to Coast Podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. Late.